relation to other books. Still on page three. Amos and Hosea are very closely related, often considered sister books. Amos is a very severe book and is viewed as the James of the Old Testament. What do I mean by that? The James of the Old Testament. All right, James, the the book of James after the book of Hebrews, those those chapters in there, James does not mess around in his book, all right? It's not like reading the Gospel of John where he talks about love and fellowship and us being together. James is like, look, man, you, if you're listening to this but you're not doing it, you're like you're looking in a mirror and you're forgetting what kind of man you are and your tongue is a word of iniquity, iniquity set on fire of hell. You adulterer and adulteresses. No, you're not. The fr- that's, that's James's message, all right? Therefore, to him that knoweth to do, go- do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. All right, that's, that's, that's the kind of message James is. It's, it's kind of the... Uh, Camp meeting preaching, all right? You go somewhere, a fire and brimstone kind of preaching. That's what, that's, that's what James is. That's what Amos is. He is the John the Baptist of the Old Testament. What was John the Baptist's message? Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The axe is laid to the root of the tree. God's fixing to cut you down. You better get right with God. What did John the Baptist call the Pharisees when they came out to see him? He called them white sepulchers and generation of vipers. All right, what are Vipers. Snakes, all right? He said, you bunch of snakes. I know why you're out here, all right? If you got up on Sunday morning, Pastor Matt looked out there and said, hey, I see that. You row of snakes right there. I know, what you, I know what's really going on. All right. We'd all get real quiet, wouldn't we? Not accustomed to that, all right? Amos is that kind of book. But both Amos and Hosea were in the northern kingdom, but Amos was a native of the southern kingdom, and Hosea was a younger contemporary of him. Similar, uh, consequently, there's much similarity uh, between the two prophets and the sins that they condemn, worship of Baal and other gods, but Hosea is not near as distinct as Amos is. Hosea has often been called the Jeremiah of Israel. What is Jeremiah known for? Crying. He is known as the weeping prophet of the southern kingdom, right? Hosea, therefore, would be the weeping prophet of what kingdom? Northern kingdom. Jeremiah looked forward to the Babylonian captivity. Hosea wept as he looked forward to the Assyrian captivity. Keep those distinctions in your mind. We'll not take the time right now to compare the verses in notes. You can do that on your own. Hosea was a contemporary of Amos in Israel and Isaiah and Micah in Judah. And he apparently antedated or predated Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel by about 150 years. Hosea is the first in our arrangement of the minor prophets, but he is not the oldest of the books. Many people believe that Jonah and Joel preceded him. In addition to Micah, who prophesied to both kingdoms, the northern tribe had only three prophets, Jonah, Amos, and Hosea. The southern tribes had 12. Why do you think that's so? Three and twelve. That's part of it. You still stare at me until I tell you? All right, is that it? Why don't you think about it, all right? What was the spiritual state of the two kingdoms? All right, the northern kingdom was wicked. The southern kingdom had periods of revival, right? When you respond to the light that God gives you, what does he give you? More light, all right? More light. If you do not respond, what does he do? He stops it, all right? In fact, if you have light, but you don't obey the light, what does the Bible say about that? Light becomes darkness to you. All right? And so you have the northern kingdom who never repent, never return, no revival. God gives them three prophets, and they go into captivity. That's all they get, three prophets. The south, southern kingdom, has periods of revival and return. Because of that, God gives them more grace. All right? What is the quickest way to get grace from God? Repent, obey. That's exactly right. He responds to that. One other issue. One other issue. God, in his foreknowledge, knows, doesn't he? Who's going to repent, who doesn't, right? Sometimes God limits 
the preaching of the prophets so that we have less to answer for. So that even in his judgment, he's merciful. Do you understand what I mean by that? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right? Sometimes God will limit the spiritual influence in your life because he knows you're not going to change. He knows it. He knows it. And because of that, he's gracious to you. Because the more you know, the more you have to answer for. In fact, there's a few places, and I think it's in Jeremiah. I could be mistaken. It might be in Isaiah. I think it's Jeremiah. Where God tells the prophet Jeremiah, stop praying for them. Stop praying for them. Why would he tell them to stop praying for them? Because every time that Jeremiah prayed, they had more to answer for. More to answer for. He said, stop praying for them. They're not going to change. Stop praying for them. They have less to answer for. That lets me know something. My grandma and my mom are praying for me. When I'm sinning against that. I better be careful. <laughs> you have to answer for all that. Absolutely. It counts. It counts. And God and his kindness. A lot of times I tell the guys with a mission, I say, look, if you know that you're not going to get right, if you plan on going out and using, leave today. Don't leave in three weeks. Leave today. Because if you leave in three weeks, you've got three more weeks of preaching in the morning and preaching at night and book work to do in church and the influence of God upon your life that you're going to have to give an account for if you have no intention of ever doing right, leave today. Leave today. Why? So you've got less to answer for her. Less to answer for, all right? And the better thing to do is repent and do right. But if you're dead set in your heart to do wickedness, God will let you. He'll let you, all right? Just we have the issue of Balaam to illustrate that for us. You know that story. Do you know that story, Summer? I'll tell you that story, all right? Susan, can I take a minute just to chase this rabbit just to make sure? Okay, thank you. All right, now, the, uh, the story of Balaam is, is that Balaam was a false prophet. He was a prophet of God, but he was one that, pursued his prophetic office for the monetary gain that he could get. Balak, the king of Moab, saw the nation of Israel, this was even prior to their possession of the promised land, growing in size and number, camped right outside of his kingdom. And he said, go call the man of God. He said, I'm going to get him to curse the children of Israel. And so Balak sends emissaries and gold and silver and gifts to Balaam's house. And he says, Balaam, there's a nation right outside us that's growing. Millions of people camped outside our borders, and we want you to come curse them. Balaam said, let me pray about it. So he goes to his room to pray. God, can I go curse your people? Some things you don't need to pray about. You understand that, all right? God said, no, you can't do it. So Balaam gets up in the morning, and he says, sorry, fellas. God won't let me do it. They go back to Balak. Balak says, look, he said, we got to have some relief Send more honorable emissaries with bigger gifts, nicer chariots and robes and whatever it is they wanted. And they came to Balaam's house and they said, Balaam, please come curse God's people. Balaam said, let me pray about it. Now, had he already prayed about it? What did God say? God said no. He gets down to pray. God said, if they ask you again in the morning, you can go. So Balaam jumped up in the morning, woke him up, said, come on, fellas. God said I could go. And so he got together his entourage of all of the emissaries and everything, and they're going down the road, and Balaam's riding on his donkey. And the donkey turns out, the first time he just sets down in the middle of the road, won't go. And Balaam begins to beat him. And he gets the donkey up, and the donkey goes a little while later and runs out into a field off the road. Balaam beats him in anger and gets him back in the road. The third time, the donkey crushes Balaam's leg between a stone wall and the road. And he begins to beat the donkey. And the donkey says, why do you keep beating me like that? Balaam evidently was not surprised at all that the donkey had talked to him because he replied, because you're acting like a... I could use a word right there, but it's probably a little bit inappropriate, all right? You're acting like a donkey. And the Bible says God opened Balaam's eyes and he could see what the donkey saw, that the angel of the Lord was standing in the road waiting to kill Balaam. For his disobedience. Did he disobey? God said he could go. Why did God say he could go? In any capacity. Because Balaam wanted to go. Sometimes God will say, go ahead. That's what you want? Go ahead. Go ahead. And the angel of the Lord will be waiting on the road to kill you. But the end of the story is, once Balaam saw what the donkey saw, probably kissed that donkey, 
but it's not in the Bible. That's probably what he did. He came to Balak and said, all right, show me where they're at. They took him up on a high mountain. The children of Israel were spread all over the place, and he built, made a bunch of sacrifices, Balak did to his God, and said, curse them. And Balaam said, Balaam said, blessed be the nation of Israel, God's people. They're going to multiply. And Balak said, that's not what I told you to say. He said, I can only say what God puts in my mouth. He said, well, come over here. And they took him to the other side of the encampment, offered a bunch of sacrifices, and made a big to-do about it, and said, all right, pronounce the curse. And he said, blessed be the people of God. They're going to prosper and win. And it just went on and on like that. So God wrought a great victory. But if you read in the book of Numbers, it tells us that when the children of Israel fought and conquered the land of Moab, they killed Balaam, killed him, the prophet of God, who chased monetary gain instead of being honest to the Lord. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that God will let you go your own way if you want to bad enough. And most of us in this room have regrets in the past that illustrate that truth quite adequately. Don't need to go into any great detail about it. But I do want you to grasp that, that three in the north, 12 in the south. All right? So Brother Dusty, that comes to a total of 15, and there's only 14 minor prophets. Why is that? It's in your notes right there. I wait. Micah was for both. There you go. All right? Micah prophesied to both. If you want to read some historical background about Hosea's prophecy, you'll find it in 2 Kings 15 through 17. Look at the heading, People to Whom It Was Written and Spoken. Primarily to the northern kingdom, although Judah is referred to 14 times. But the northern kingdom is often addressed as Ephraim or Ephraim, my wife fusses at me for pronouncing it wrong, 36 times. Why? Talk to me, it's right there in your notes. All right, there are leaders in the rebellion and the apostasy. That's exactly right, all right? Sometimes God, when he talks about Ephraim, he's referring to the nation of Israel, to the northern kingdom, and sometimes he calls it Israel. He does that almost the same amount of times. But what does the term Israel mean? The prince of God, one who strove or strives with God and prevails, okay? When God calls them Israel, what's he doing? Just in that little word. Reminding them them of what they used to be, and they are not. They are not, all right? Did Jesus ever do that? Ever do that? When Jesus dealt with the disciples, particularly one loudmouthed disciple... When he really wanted to deal with him, what did he call him? Call him Simon. What's Simon? Simon was his name before he met Jesus. Jesus called him Peter later. Why did he switch and use that name? It's just a little reminder. It's just a little reminder. You remember when Isaac had two boys? What were the two boys' names? Jacob and Esau, all right? Who's the oldest? Esau, all right? They're twins. Esau came out. He was a hairy man, the Bible says, man of the field. Jacob was a plain man, liked to stay home and cook, all right? Probably had his own show and stuff, you know. He's in, Esau's out there, Bow Hunters International, doing something, killing, killing deer. And the Bible says that Esau despised his birthright. He was supposed to inherit the family name, carry on the lineage, carry on the principles of God. He was supposed to be the leader spiritually in the home uh, after his father Isaac was dead. And one time he came in from hunting. Jacob's making something that smells good, a pot of beans or something similar to that. And Esau said, give me some of those beans. Jacob said, give me your birthright. He said, what good is the birthright to me if I'm dying of starvation? Give me the beans. So they made a deal, all right? So Isaac came, time for him to die. He was blind. He said, Esau, go fix for me that venison that I love, and I'll give you the blessing. And the Bible says, as soon as he left, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, said, Jacob, come here. She said, go kill a goat and let me fix it for you. She put the goat skin on Jacob's arm so that he was hairy. Esau must have been really hairy. He put a goat skin on somebody and it, to pass him off. And Jacob said, I smell like Jacob. I put Esau's clothes on. He came walking in to Isaac, and Isaac said, Who is that? He said, I'm Esau. I'm Esau. 
He said, you don't sound like Esau. He said, but you feel like him. So he gave him the food, and he passed on the family blessing to Jacob. As soon as Jacob got done and went out, Esau came in. Daddy, I got your food ready. Isaac said, who are you? He said, I'm Esau. He said, then who was that that I just blessed? And Esau said, that was Jacob, and I'm going to kill him, basically. And he said, please bless me. And he said, well, I can give you a little blessing, but I gave most of it to your brother. All right? And that's what that passage in Hebrews means, that Esau found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. It wasn't that he was trying to repent. He couldn't get his daddy to change his mind, even though he was begging for it, because the blessing had already been given. And so Jacob runs off for his life and spends 20 years with his uncle Laban, and through the trickery of everything, ends up with two of Laban's daughters, and their two, two servants as his concubines. He has 12 sons, which become the tribes of the nation of Israel, pretty much. And he gets a whole lot of Laban's wealth because God blesses him, right? They change his wages multiple times, and Laban will say, okay, you can have all the spotted cows that are born. All the cows that were born will be spotted. Laban will say, okay, you can have all the solid cows, and all the cows that were born will be solid. And it's just God just blessing Jacob. But on the way back... He hears that Esau's coming to meet him with a band of 400 armed men. And in Genesis 32 and 33, he divides his family into two groups, the group he loves the most and the group he loves the least, and sends them across the river. And he says that way if Esau falls on one group, the other group will escape. And the Bible says he is on the, by the brook Jabbok at night, and a man jumps out of the bushes and begins to wrestle with him. All right? You know that story. And they wrestle all night, all night long, and neither one of them prevails. And at the end of the night, as the morning was coming up, the man, whom we know to be the angel of the Lord, in fact, we read about it in the book of Hosea, that it's the angel of the Lord, it's Jesus, reached down and touches Jacob's thigh. And in an instant, Jacob is crippled. Now, I want you to think about that just for a second. If you've been wrestling with a guy all night, and the word wrestling means rolling around in the dirt. You know, they're not thumb wrestling, they're arm wrestling. They are rolling all over the place, and it's been going on for hours. So they're exhausted, right? And in the midst of all of that struggle, the man suddenly just reaches down, and you're crippled. Immediately, you're crippled. What does that tell you? He could have done it any time, right? So automatically, I realize I'm not wrestling with who I thought I was wrestling with, all right? It's, it's, I'm way out of my league, right? If he touched my thigh and I'm crippled, all night long he's been playing me. That's what Jacob realizes, all right? And so if you go to wrestling and you get crippled, automatically what do you begin to do? Well, I'm, I'm holding myself up now, right? I'm clinging, to him. Instead of fighting against him, I'm having to hold myself up because he just crippled my leg. So Jacob realizes, hey, I'm not wrestling with Esau. I'm wrestling with somebody who's way beyond me. And he says, I'm going to hold you. And the angel says, let me go. The morning's coming. He said, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. I know who you are. Bless me. And the angel asks him a question. You know what the angel says? What is your name? Why did he ask him his name? Last time somebody asked him his name, what did he say? What does Jacob mean? Deceiver, trickster, supplanter. And so the angel said, what's your name? What do you think Jacob said? Jacob! I think that's what he said? Jacob. That's right, it's Jacob. No more Jacob. From now on, it's going to be Israel, prince of God. Because you have power with me. Power? How did Jacob have power? Did he win the fight or lose it? From all physical appearances, he lost it. But he won. How do you win? You win by losing. That's how you win. You win by losing the right battle. Giving in to God. Sometimes he has to cripple you to get your attention. When you give in and stop fighting and start clinging, well, then you won. Oh, you think you lost, but that's when you won. But he'll ask you, what's your name? What's your name? James. 
No more James. No more Summer. No more Danny. I'm not going to live that way anymore. Is your new name. Prince with God. You won the fight. And the Bible says that Jacob came and walked in the morning, limping on his leg, came across the river. He's been wrestling all night. What do you think he looks like? <laughs> all right, he's exhausted, filthy, and hobbling. His kids say, Daddy, Daddy, what happened to you? He said, I've seen the face of God, and I lived. And there's a dramatic change in the way Jacob lived his life, right? And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that when he dies, he blesses the sons of Joseph, and he crossed his arms, Manasseh and Ephraim, and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. Why is he leaning on his staff? One reason, because he's old. But the second reason is he crippled all his life, all his life. A lot of us have stuff in our past where God got our attention. We're still dragging that foot. I mean, you know, it's always with us. But then we begin to look at it as a good thing, not a bad thing. I remember one time I was preaching in Pennsylvania, and uh, there was a guy playing softball with us, and he had a bad eye. It was one of those kind of eyes that you looked at a guy, and you had to move to see, you know, where, is he look, are you looking at me? You know, you know what I'm talking about? I'm not trying to be mean, but, I, you know, it's, if he ran into you in the hall and said, why don't you, why don't you, Look where you're going. So why don't you go where you're looking? I mean, I, 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 I just don't know. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out. You can have either way. Just let me know. But he, he, it, as I was, and I asked him about it. And I got to know him well enough to ask him. And he, was like, he said, I got stabbed with a butcher knife in that eye. I said, you got stabbed with an eye in that not, with a knife? He said, yeah, I did. He said, uh, me and some friends at a bar cutting up, messing around a girl. We went over to the girl's house, followed her over there knocking on her door, and he said, when they opened the door, a guy just came out, and he stabbed right through the screen door, and it hit me right in the eye. I said, man, that's awful. He said, no, it's not. He said, it's awesome. He said, because that brought me to the end of myself, and I realized I was a hopeless sinner, and God saved and changed my soul. I thank him for getting stabbed in the eye all the time. All his life, he's looking over here, you know. He's crippled, crippled, but God changed him. God changed him. But when God calls the nation of Israel... Hey, Israel, what's he saying? What's he reminding them of? What you could have been, what you should be, what you should be. God ever do that to you? Hey, Pastor James Lingerfelt, you know what I'm talking about? Brother Theodore, Teddy. God knows how to dig it, doesn't he? Knows how to twist it just to remind us what we ought to be. He refers to them as Ephraim. He refers to them as Israel. Thirdly, he calls them Samaria six times. Why? That was the capital city, all right? Have you ever heard people talk about Washington did this and Washington did that? Well, they're referring, they're talking about the capital city of Washington, but it's, it's the whole United States that acts from that central location. And King Omri made the uh, Samaria, the capital city, uh, during his reign. And so sometimes he refers to them as Samaria. He's talking about the whole nation. So what are the three names we're going to hear him call the northern kingdom? Ephraim, Israel, Samaria. Good. You will see that again. Just telling you. All right? Remember those things. Now, um, read Second Kings 15 to 17 for the background of the book of Hosea. Jeroboam made Israel to sin, and Hosea's prophecies are about 150 years later. And that idolatry that Jeroboam the first created had grown and grown since the time of Jeroboam. I keep seeing these typos. That's supposed to be time. I wish I could blame all this typing on Miss Carolyn, but I can't. It was a different secretary. I didn't do it. Um, Hosea 1.1 shows the time of the prophecy, and I put it there in your notes. In the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Okay, What's he indicating for us in those terms? We're going to go over this over and over again to make sure that we have it. What's he saying? He's referring to two sets of kings. Where's one of them? The northern kingdom, all right? He was a king much longer than those in the south. Jeroboam, not the first Jeroboam, but the one who was the son of Joash. And in Judah, who were the kings? 
How many of them were there? Four. Who were they? All right, that's, that's the time period. So when you read in the Bible about Uzziah or Ahaz or Jotham or Hezekiah, you know what's going on in the northern kingdom. Who's up there preaching? Hosea's preaching. All right, when you read about the second Jeroboam, the son of Joash, who's preaching? Who's the man of God in the land? One of them. Hosea, all right? I'm not trying to be too basic. I just want you to grasp the time frame of what's going on in the message of Hosea, all right? Uh, out of the seven kings of Hosea's time, four of them were murdered by their successors. So let you know what a wonderful, wonderful time that he was uh, preaching in. All right, let's look at these four kinds of apostasies, and we'll stop tonight uh, with the chapter by chapter summary. Four kinds of apostasy going on during Hosea's days, and these are not mine. H.T. Sells. Uh, to this political apostasy. She no longer seeks God in her hour of need, but she calls upon the two nations. What are the two nations? Assyria and Egypt. Remember I drew the map for you on the board? Uh, and the two factions of people in the land, some of them favored Assyria, some of them favored Egypt, and so you got that political unrest, no longer sought God, but they became vassals and... Uh, uh, tributaries to Assyria and to Egypt. Then there's religious apostasy, the substitution of calf worship and Baal worship for that of Jehovah. Who introduced Baal worship? Am I remember? Who's the most wicked king in the north and his wonderful wife, Jezebel? Ahab, exactly right. All right, which led to moral apostasy. Turn to Hosea 4.2. Amen. Good. Let's start with verse 1 to get the context. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. How do we know? Look at the list of sins. God doesn't mind naming it by, read them for me, swearing, lying, killing, stealing, committing adultery. They break out and blood touches blood. Now, when I read about killing and committing adultery, would you put swearing in that same list? Typically not, all right? But is God... Oh, he groups them all together. What about lying? It's just a, little, just, just a little white lie. No, God puts it right in there with committing adultery and stealing. So we don't, Hosea helps us see sin as God sees sin. He said, when you swear, you commit an adultery. When you lie, you commit an adultery. You're cheating on me, and I'm jealous. I'm jealous. Jealous. And I'm going to let the results of your actions bring you back to me because they will destroy you. All right, moral apostasy. Swearing, lying, killing, stealing, committing adultery. Six distinct forms of moral evil are mentioned. And then covenant apostasy. God had made an agreement with his people. They broke the covenant, breached his trust, and because of that, he could not let it go on. Now, I've given you uh, chapter by chapter summary each thing, just a summary of what is in each chapter. I'm not required you to know that. I just want you to be familiar with those things. Next time we're together, we'll get into the interpretation, which is beyond, tonight has been a lot of background stuff. But we'll get into how we apply it to our life and the spiritual truth that we can dig out of that. In the meantime, I want you to read the book of Hosea again, or the first time, and then begin to answer those questions. I can pretty much assure you that next week we will finish Hosea. And uh, so we, I will give you Joel's notes then. And uh, so uh, your Hosea homework will not be due next Monday, but the following Monday. All right? You two weeks to do 10 questions. I think you can handle it. Feel free to email me or call me if you have any questions. All right? Anybody have any questions tonight?